there's something there that lets you know it's there. This house, it's really grabbed me. It's got its hooks synced into me. There's a lot of things that happen in this house that we can't explain. Oh, it's, it's wild just being there. It has this, you know, this aura about it of, uh, of mystery. I wanted a simple house. I wanted an A-frame house, and I wanted uh, a loft upstairs with a balcony. And when we first drove by here, it was just a beautiful meadow. It was covered with wildflowers. It just took my breath away. And I said, you know, that's it. I had the house subcontracted, built like I wanted. When they started building, we noticed that there were some strange things happening. The doors would slam. I mean, nothing else would be blowing around, but the door would slam. They put the doorbell in, and it would ring. And you'd go to the door, there's nobody there. I remember deadbolting the door and going upstairs, and as soon as I got upstairs, you know, we heard bang. I looked out, and the door was open, but it had the deadbolt still sticking out. This house had a lot of activity that was unusual, and we knew that. I made peace with that, I lived with that until 2011. At 11.30, and I was probably in bed by 12 o'clock, and it was pitch black dark in here. And a light came on, and I opened my eyes, and uh, there was this, it was light, it was a patch of, of tunnel of daylight from the ceiling to the floor and it was daylight in this tube of light and it was pitch black in the rest of the room i just stared at it after about 10 seconds it just went blink it went out i just covered up my head then i pulled back the covers and i saw there were like real bright red buttons of light I had a flashlight on the bed, and I shined the flashlight all around the room, and uh, there was nothing unusual. But I really did feel watched. I felt a presence. I felt observed. I didn't know if it was a religious experience. I didn't know if it was a UFO experience. I didn't know what it was. It scared me to death. That was a turning point in my life because I decided that I would not stay here by myself at night. I never mentioned to hardly anybody in this town about the paranormal activity in my house because I wasn't sure how they would take it. It's a, it's a, it's in the Bible Belt, and you know, I, you know, I just I didn't know how they would take it. Florence is a suburb of Jackson. It's in the statistical metropolitan area. This is a community that's that's got good neighbors. They probably pretty much keep to themselves, and that may be what makes them good neighbors. I think that people are real nice. If somebody dies, uh, everybody comes and brings food, and they go to the cemetery, or they go to the funeral homes, or do what they can for you. We just country. <laughs> just, just country. I went down to an altar Florence is a great town, but it's a southern town. Some people are open-minded and some people are very closed-minded. Florence is very Bible Belt-ish. Bringing in the paranormal to them is unbelievable. 
Do you believe in ghosts? Uh, believe in what? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I am a Christian. I do believe in the Holy Spirit. Y'all, y'all go stay out in the empty houses all night. I'll go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, embarrassed because I thought, you know, I'm just going to look like an idiot. So I didn't tell anybody until it became known enough that I knew they were going to do a little news program on it. On the outside, it looks like your typical home, but inside it is anything but normal. The candle just got up and landed. <laughs> it didn't just tipple over and it didn't shoot over. It just kind of levitated over there. After that news segment, that just kind of validated to me that it was okay to express it because I just kept it inside. I didn't tell a lot of people, but once, once it was documented, I felt perfectly free then to talk about it. And it was really a big moment. That kind of made it real for me. And they, they, that's, when it, that's when I started being really open to really uh, trying to find somebody who could uh, maybe come up with some explanation. I started talking to a friend of mine at work, and she said she knew a young investigator named John Bullard who uh, might be interested. My name is John Bullard. I'm a marketing director for about 40 different restaurants. What got me into the paranormal is ever since I was a little child, I would Sometimes I see shadow figures, I would hear voices. And I didn't know if I was crazy or not. And I wanted to validate it for myself. Uh, I didn't want to validate it for anybody else. I just wanted to figure out that I wasn't crazy. And I started doing research about the supernatural and the paranormal. And I kind of, you know, over time wanted to test the waters. So I went to supposedly haunted places to test the waters to see if I could actually capture something, if I could feel something or sent something that I sensed when I was a child. We accidentally called an incredible spirit voice EVP, electronic voice phenomena, and that kind of changed me. So my what is that one out there in the woods? You see that? It is in the woods. You see it? Oh, no. I guess shine closer to it. Shine. <laughs> What's that? What was that? What? Did you say play something said in here? No. Did y'all not you didn't hear that? No. So shiny. In here. There. There. Did you hear somebody say in here? Did someone just say in here? Did you hear that? Oh, I heard that. Like something. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm yeah, sorry. Well, my biggest goal that I set in my mind was to document evidence that was clean, clear, and easy to view. Somebody just make that noise. I was referred to the Mississippi house by a friend of a friend. When we pull up to the house, you would never think there was anything really going on inside the house. So we were really skeptical, but we figured we'd hear her out. Alice told us about the lights that she experienced in the bottom bedroom and some other sounds that she had heard in the house. And just from the, the pre-investigation that we did, it really started to intrigue me things that have moved, lights that have turned off, and it's something different than just a paranormal investigation. We have done about nine years. It's the longest location that we have ever done consistently. We have a DVR system that is filming the house 24 hours a day to try to capture something else. There's definitely something else out there, whether it's a uh, you know, another world or something that we're tapping into. Uh, it's it's up it's up for debate. I have something very special for you today. We have Brad Cooney. Brad is part of the Mississippi House, and it is very well documented as a place that is haunted. So tell me a little bit about the house. Just about everybody who we bring in there, just it creeps them out. There's a different energy in there. Like you mentioned in your opening, it's very well documented. The evidence is captured. amazing.
Good? Well, you get those cobwebs out and see, I'm not home so much. I didn't, uh, I didn't realize all those cobwebs yeah, are back there. Sense. This is really out of my comfort zone, this whole thing. So I've lived here uh, 12 years, 12 years now. And this is where I do all my, my podcasts and uh, throughout my, my boxing journalistic career, I've accrued quite a few things in the boxing world, writing for magazines and writing for boxing websites. I, I've yeah. met just about everybody there is that's anybody in the boxing world. Uh, Mike Tyson, Oscar De La Hoya, Floyd Mayweather. I don't go to the fights anymore, though. I don't cover it. I did it for a lot of years. It was just time to start another chapter. I got into the paranormal uh, in the, in standing in this very room. I watched TV one day and, and a segment that a local news broadcaster did on Miss Alice's house caught my attention. I stopped what I was doing. I started watching it and realized it was really close. So I reached out to that homeowner and her friend that was also on that segment. Because it was really interesting to me, especially how close it was. I was like, wow, usually you hear something taunted or whatever, or whatever it might be, it's a long drive, but this was so close to where I live. So I would be interested, it would be really interesting for me to, uh, to see if they'll have me in there and take a look around. So that's how, that's how I started getting into the paranormal. And it just took off from there. I met Alice, and when she told me her story, I believed her instantly. In fact, the first day I came here, we had we had some activity happen in the house, which really piqued my interest at, at that point. It actually, they said it was heading towards the stairs, and then when we went, went out the door, oh, Look at oh, that. oh, oh, right there. The next week, I came back again. I captured some more evidence um, that I felt I couldn't explain, and, and it just blossomed from there. We had major equipment failure because there's spirit activity all up in this sucker. But this is a REM pod that's going nuts. I learned some of the stuff through research, trying things. Then I got to where I would buy some equipment. That's, that's kind of how I learned how to investigate. Brad Cooney came along a few years ago and really helped out to what we were doing in the Mississippi House. It's good to get two investigators who are separate, who originally never knew each other, who come together and are experiencing the same things in the house. <laughs> this is my, I'm beginning my third year investigating this house. Once I think I've figured something out, something else happens. Some things I've debunked in, in, in the home, but many things I, I can't debunk. And that in itself is, is why I keep doing this, because there's things that happen here that I just simply can't figure out why it's happening. That might have been the most profound noises we've ever heard in here. Wow. During our investigations, we've heard voices in this house, doors open. seen light shut off so we would start asking can you shut that light off again and we've actually gotten direct responses to where the light would shut off can you make a noise or do something for us that will tell us that we're not alone in here
myself. We believe it's possible that spirit activity, spirits that hear us are communicating with us. And we try to get as much of that as we can for possibly a breakthrough. So I do feel like we are teaching the spirits to communicate with us. I feel like we are teaching the dead inside the house of Mississippi uh, to communicate with us. We used a lot of trigger objects inside the house. We started putting uh, a baseball or two baseballs on the staircase in the Mississippi house. And for a while, we set them up there, and obviously we tried to communicate to the spirits that we wanted them to move the baseball, to roll it down the stairs. We want nothing more than to hear the baseball bounce down those stairs and hit the floor. That baseball sat idle for days. But then, one day just decided to up and move and fall down the steps by itself. Since then, it's happened several times. What the hell's going on in this house? Why do things move that aren't supposed to move? Things defy physics. I want answers. What happens when we die? Is there, does our, do we retain our consciousness when we cross over? And, and this is what we're hearing and seeing in, in this house? The ball moving has intrigued me the most. That's something that I'm really hungry to find out why. Why is that ball moving? Is there something behind it? Why? I have no idea why this is happening. Let's bring in somebody who might. I think that's very, very important. this does, it holds a level point. This is what we're going to shoot it from. Zero. Side to side, it's level. There might be a little slope up here, but. Way up there, yeah. I couldn't see why it would roll down there. OK. I am happy to know that it, that's level, because we do have those doors open and closed. And uh, so it's not from, you know, because somebody might say, oh, it's because your house is not level. No. Or if the ball rolls, maybe it's because your house is not level. No. Nope. I mean, what's crazy is your house has been level since since a uh, long time. 06. 06, uh-huh. Yeah, the measurements are still the same. Yeah. I hope that by bringing experts in that there will be some discoveries made that will be important to us all. How can objects move that have no apparent energy source? There's obviously an answer, but we don't know it. There's some sort of convergence of energy here that we can't explain. So in my opinion, now all that's working fine to the chandelier and these lights. And I checked the breaker. The breaker's shutting it off and good voltage there. 
this dimmer here, it works fine. Uh, sometimes the dimmers will go bad and make it, you know, go dimmer. Mm -hmm. But uh, that seems to be working fine at this time. I'm not finding anything wrong with it. So I'm not seeing anything out of the ordinary. I would, I mean, I would have liked to have seen it doing what it, what y'all said it did, though. That would be interesting to me. I think the electrical's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. I think you, you're looking at something else. So when you stop, you know, after the lights happened, you decided, I'm not gonna stay here anymore. Did you think about it when you weren't here the first few nights, you didn't stay at the house? Were you kind of wondering what was going on? Did you think about coming back and trying to stay at the house again? Or after you made nope. that decision, <laughs> that was nope, it? No, that was, that was clear cut and I'm out of there. Yeah. Because I, because I thought um, nobody could help me. I mean, if you're here and something, if there's an intelligence that's greater than you and they have these abilities that are greater than you, you know, you're gone and nobody nobody's going to be able to help. No, but I mean, you could tell the 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 real fear because again you know it's one of those things you don't talk a lot about you know especially in the south but when it gets to the point where you want to reach out to somebody which i'm glad you did um because we uncovered a whole mountain of stuff you know i think there's times that we could push ourselves but this house sometimes is so intense i have to back away there's only so much I could take, you know. <laughs> I, I have a passion for this field, documentation, but this house will push you to uh, a whole nother limit. Well, you brought up a great point about, because people have asked you and me also, why would you be scared if you've been in there so many times? It's because we've experienced what this house can do. And when you're in this house by yourself, when it's dark, lights are off, doors locked, yep. it's a different ball game. Well, it's interesting that, you know, it took the lights to be the tipping point for you to reach out and actually express it and start getting people in here to help you. I mean, maybe somebody else has experienced that. Maybe somebody else understands what it might be. Hi, Steve. Uh, this is Alice Jackson. I live in Florence, Mississippi, and I've been having a lot of um, unexplained, strange occurrences at my house for quite a few years. I'm actually having trouble living there. You know, I don't have any idea what's going on. I'm just trying to find some explanations. Then uh, I was hoping that you might be able to help. Please call me back. I would really appreciate it. So I was invited by Alice to come and investigate her house. At first, I was a little hesitant, but I talked to her on the phone, and something really is troubling her. You know, I could just tell how sincere she was and how much this house scared her. I mean, the fact that it's been 10 years and she hasn't slept in the house. Uh, the fact that she's opened it up to other people trying to figure out what is happening here. And they showed me a lot of things that I couldn't explain. There may be something paranormal happening, but it could be anything, you know, but I want to start checking things off. Okay, I know it's not this, and I want to help them get to the bottom of it. Nice to see, see you. Oh, it's good to see you. Thank you. Really is. Uh, I have some uh, people here, and hey, we're ready to do this. John and, and Brad realize that they've sort of done about all that they can. Now it's time to, to step in and bring it to the next level. It's time to bring in some, some other people. I got all of these different experts to come together and get answers. Millions of years ago when the dinosaurs walked the earth, this area was actually the bottom of a shallow sea. 
you find a dinosaur bone in Mississippi, it's not gonna be a land-based dinosaur. In fact, there's a huge prehistoric whale in the Mississippi Science Museum. All this life settles to the bottom and over the eons becomes limestone. Florence was an early area of mining for this limestone. The house is not an 1800s house. The house was built in the 90s. And even at the construction of the house, she already had experiences going on. To me, I would assume that's something associated with the land and not necessarily the house. What we're saying is that these large deposits of energy, these things can be drawing from that. There's that much more here. That theory holds true that whatever is happening in any haunted place needs energy to do what it's doing. That's like, you know, plug right in. I'm Chilin Dai from Jackson State University, Assistant Professor of Physics. There is a theory out there that limestone mm -hmm. can perhaps retain energy and release it. Uh, would that be something that's possible in your opinion? I think it's very possible. Limestone and mineral, other minerals, they can absorb energy. The simplest way for a lamb or rock to absorb energy is the heat. So they can be heated. So then they have this energy, thermal energy, and then they can deliver this energy. So energy can be transferred through them. Do you think that mm -hmm. anything like underground mm -hmm. water or moving water mm -hmm. could create a static charge? Is that even a possibility? Moving water underground, uh, the Earth cannot create any charge. Maybe because of lighting something from nature, it can be charged but they cannot create new charges. So this is a law. Okay. So you can see here, mm -hmm. and this is a, a ball here, and... Um, Where the, are the ball? And see that little circle right oh, there? Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. And what happens a lot of the time is it will propel forward mm -hmm. and just start to uh, fall down the stairs. And in your opinion, it, would it be possible that energy could do that? It's not an earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> that was my first thought. <laughs> yeah, it's a... Yeah. <laughs> Michael Dennon, I'm the Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning here at UC Irvine. So it's really interesting footage like this where you have like a ball, in this case there's the ball on the stairs and then it suddenly moves and rolls down the stairs. First of all, it's a ball. So that's kind of makes it a little easier because those do roll. Um, the challenge is figuring out what would have kicked or got the ball rolling. The dramatic part is simply that the ball starts at all. Being on stairs, once it gets going, it's gonna fall down the stairs and that part is pretty straightforward. This is a bit of a challenge. You can't deny that the ball moved. I can speculate, I can say things like, you know, there's a little bit of shaking in the house, some wind you didn't notice, which is harder to believe because wind's hard to move a ball. There's a lot of ways I can imagine if I want to fool you, I could certainly set up ways that a ball would move with nobody home. If the ball is made of iron and then they have the uh, magnets to attract or, you know, repel, that that is a different story about this. See. So you think if there maybe is more trickery than... Yeah. I bet air will do a little bit. There's no breeze coming through this house that's this powerful. No. A ball can move by itself. Maybe we could not see the uh, force. For example, like air. We cannot see the air, but we can prove there are air there. We could not see the motion but we can see the results, we can see that it's moving. As a scientist, I don't believe ghosts at all. I believe science. <laughs> <laughs> Without it being a complete hoax, how would you explain something like this? I know ultimately the end result is a physics action, right? The ball starts moving. 
So the immediate cause of that also has to be a physics action. I, I do think it's, it's, it's not air, it's not wind, uh, it's certainly not a magnet. I, I think we could check under the stairs. Maybe. Here. Do you want to see what happens if I give it a, a bit of a punch up here? Yeah. See if the ball moves? Yep. Sure. Go ahead. Anything? Nothing. It's not even moving. If you really were to I guess rule out what I would call the trivial physical cases and rule out the, the cases of hoaxes, then you're into this interesting realm of, okay, something physical caused it, but what caused that physical? Most ideas of a ghost involve the ghost being non-physical in some fundamental way. Any paranormal explanation is still going to involve something applying a force to the ball. And so therefore, the thing applying the force, by definition, we've just made it physical. So it's just an interesting conundrum that to me moves it from science to detective story. In the years that I've been here, I want to experience some lights. I've seen so many things in this house and with my own eyes, but that's what I want to uh, that's what I want to see, those lights that you saw. We got all kinds of just great stuff and just stuff that's just direct responses and it's, it's fully intelligent. You know, it's not residual, uh, it's intelligent stuff happening in the house, but there's that carrot <laughs> that's dangling, it's like the holy those grail lights. Of, the holy grail of what we're trying to capture here is those, those, the lights that Alice saw. Over the years, I've experienced one thing with lights. So I was upstairs in the bedroom at the Mississippi house with the door closed. We were doing an EVP session. It was me and one fellow investigator. And the bottom frame of the door turned bright white. And it was almost like a camera shutter, two to three flashes of white. I sat there kind of in awe for a few minutes. It was not raining, there was no thunder, the night was clear. I opened the door and it never happened again. We luckily did capture that on film. Miss Alice has had experiences with the lights. The, these are the, the, the lights that have scared her to where she doesn't want to, to live in this house anymore. I personally don't feel that's a spirit activity or ghost. I think that's something different perhaps extraterrestrial. It's something different going on with those lights. There is a woman who lives seven miles from me. She's an elderly lady. And so this happened when she was a child, but she said that uh, her whole house lit up in a glow. She said it was brighter than the sun. I remember that, that expression. Many years ago, when I, lived, when I worked in Florence, Alice was in and out of the library where I worked a lot because she lived close by. And I was telling her about this light that I saw when I was growing up right down in this community. And I was asleep at night and I was awake and just in a flash and my, my light, my bedroom was lighter than, well, it was just a white light, a clear white, brilliant light. Flash bulb bright. And, it's yeah, just super, like super bright. The trees and the house on the hill and the brilliant, everything brilliant. was just brilliant, brilliant light. It just faded away. And I just went back to bed and went back to sleep. You know, it's, it's, there's too much space to be the only ones here. She doesn't know what that is in her house and I don't know what that was at my house. It's strange, I, you know, it's really strange. The woman I spoke to about, Alice uh -huh. Jackson, yes. yeah. uh, she had said that in her bedroom, mm -hmm. uh, there was a glowing light and then disappeared. In, in your opinion, is there 
anything in terms of energy, science, things that are happening that could create an illuminated ball of light? A light cannot happen spontaneously. It has to uh, have origin to have this light. If we have other light, maybe reflection from window from other place, it's possible to have that. Or they have other energy transfer to become light, like uh, thermal energy, electric energy. So it's kind of a complicated question to, to be answered simply. There's a phenomenon in nature called St. Elmo's fire, which is a static electricity discharge. If you have a buildup of static electricity for some reason, yeah, it can cause a glow. Uh, especially if it has some kind of medium to act on it. Sometimes all it takes is just dust in the air. If it were ball lightning that she was seeing in her house, she wouldn't have to ask because it would tear something up because this is a lot of energy. It's very destructive. Strange lights are often the easiest to offer different explanations to. Of all physics phenomena, light is the most flexible in a weird way. The challenge is often recreating them or figuring out exactly what did it. Um, at a level that would make someone confident that it really was just a physics effect. If I knew that it was had a natural explanation, you know, like, uh, you know, I've heard now various theories about what could cause lights, and if somebody definitively said uh, it's the minerals in the soil, something, you know, the natural that's causing the lights, then I would immediately not be afraid. But uh, since that hasn't happened, it might be UFO stuff. It, it might be, you know, some sort of interdimensional stuff that was from some civilization that was more advanced than we are. So in the beginning, you thought they were extraterrestrial? You it, it, cro it crossed my mind. It really did cross my mind. That was the very first thing I thought. I have never seen anything that I can reconcile this with in my history, you know, reading or anything, except maybe stuff that I had heard about UFO stuff, you know, beams of light and people disappearing. My name's Calvin Parker, and I was abducted in 1973, October 1973. It was just over here, probably the length of a football field, and back that way. And that's where it sat down. And when it originally sat down, I was facing the river, and I could see the blue lights coming over my shoulder. When they stopped and that opened up, then that real bright light come out. Three robot-looking creatures came out. Two of them got a hold of myself, took us aboard, gave us an examination. I didn't know what a UFO was or an alien was until this happened. And I still don't know that it was aliens. It could have been something from an inner dimension that uh, traveled through it. I hadn't ruled that out. All I know is something happened. Certainly for modern physics, we do believe that the world is multidimensional, more than just the three dimensions of space we move through and the one dimension of time. Most of what we understand about physics is probably best explained with extra dimensions. It becomes interesting to try and figure out and understand what that means for things like multidimensional beings and how different things interact with our reality. And we're not even at the beginning from a physics point of view to make statements or understand about that. I think that's an area of physics that we're gonna find fascinating in the future. I do think that the potential uh, of extraterrestrial life is, is there. Do I think it, it's in Alice's bedroom? No, I, I definitely don't think she's, you know, waiting for the next alien visit, but something scared her, uh, and that's what we're trying to figure out. What is it? I think it's something paranormal. This is something ghostly. This is something of our world. I don't think it's anything that has to do with outer space, UFOs, or extraterrestrials. We are recording. Ready? Okay, I hear Born ready. <laughs> Let's make sure this bad boy's still 
We're here tonight to communicate with any spirit that's in this house. We've been here for a long time. We've logged a lot of hours in this house. Any intelligent spirit that's in this house tonight, we want you to come down here and communicate with us and make yourself known. There's devices to alarm to let us know that you're near us. We want you to come down here and just like you have many times before, let us know that you're here. Let us feel your energy. And I'm going to saw a light dim. There's a REM pod. That, REM pod is going saw off. The chandelier light dim right before that? Just by a few seconds. Don't worry about the ND. Oh, we got a REM pod in here. here. All right, y'all go ahead. I'll stay in here and watch this one. Steady. Interesting. This one off. Oh, steady. See, I have to see patterns. If all three REM pods goes off, I'm a little more interested in this one where REM pod going off. I'd like to see like the light go off and the REM pods go off <laughs> at the same time. That'd be much more convincing yeah. for me. That'd be pretty awesome. We're trying to understand and help you communicate. Throughout the years we've been here. Oh, we've got room oh. pods everywhere. Oh, all of them are going off. We got one over here on the mantel, one on the stairs. Um... Brad, anything back here going on? Just the room pod. You have the room pod? We got pod another room pod. All three of them were going off. So all three just went off at the same yes. time? Which is pretty again. cool because I, I had mentioned before I want to see all three of them go off. A yellow and green. I can't get a sentence out without it going off, huh? <laughs> oh, oh good. Right. Good. Is that good. one going off, too? Yeah, this one yep. up here. Let's check this I'll one. I'll just shut my mouth. <laughs> it's a little more interesting to me, for sure, when all these devices go off. However, I'm still not 100% sold. We use some uh, devices, and uh, they measure energy. And uh, we had one set up in the living room, one in the back bedroom, one on the stairs. We wanted to separate them as much as possible. Uh, and we do that so it's consistency. If one can go off, we can manipulate another one. Uh, if they all go off at the same time, that's, that's pretty impressive, which is indicative of some kind of energy, something, uh, something going on, something not normal. It's something over the years I've just never had happen. The light of God surrounds us. Mm -hmm. The love of God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. The presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is, and all is well. There's a REM pod. Uh, where's that REM pod? Is that that REM pod up there? Back bedroom? Back room. Is that you, or is it going off? Back room. Hit. OK, great. This room is heavy, man. And as soon as I came in the room, I felt uneasy. We've actually had two mediums who didn't know each other and hadn't been here before. And both of them said that there was a figure that they felt the presence of that near that chair. And that he really was stern and, and guarded. He was like a guard for the, you know, the room, the place that he felt like it was his place. Interesting. Just like that. I can't explain that that much consistency. That was wild. Alice has had psychics investigate the house before, and she wanted to have uh, another one take a look around. And I don't use psychics on, on many investigations, just because it's very hard to quantify what they're saying. But. Uh, this was important to Alice. So we got somebody uh, from out of state. They came from California. One thing I did think it was important is uh, using a, a psychic or a medium who has never been to the house before, uh, and even furthermore, making sure they didn't have any idea where they were going. She didn't know anything, only because that would lend more credibility to what they were saying. Oh, OK. 
Okay. Now am I, do you just want me to go on, go on in? I'm Jill. I'm Alice. Come in. Nice to meet you, nice Alice. Nice to meet you, too. Thank you for having me here. Absolutely. We're delighted. <laughs> Where would you like me to go? The house is yours. OK. It's yours. Very good. So I, what I'll do is I'm just going to start down here. I am not going to say too much at first. If you have any questions, though, for me, feel free okay. to ask. OK. And I'm just going to sit. Over here. Is this a door to go outside? It is. You can open it if you like. Do you mind? No, okay. Not I at have all. to do this. I have to. Not at all. I have to get out here and look at this. It's very interesting. Can I ask you a question? Was there a house that was right over here that's no longer there? Behind, yes. yes. That's what I thought. OK. That's important to me. What I like to do is I just like to go through and pick out some really strong focal points, and then I'm going to address them like I did with that other door. I'm just checking everything out. Huh. Okay. This window. Wow. There's a lot of different dimensions going on. There's a lot of shifting going on in this house. OK. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. About a week ago, I started having some very unusual dreams that turned into what I call a series. I document them. I have a dream diary. I also sometimes sketch. What is so unusual is as soon as I saw that door went outside, I knew this was the door. Mm -hmm. This is the sketch that I did, the walking stick leaning up against the door. Do you have a walking stick? Uh, hundreds. That's, that's insane. <laughs> I, I would face as I collect. I don't even know if I should say this. I don't know. I'm a this... psychiatric nurse. I've heard of okay, so, okay. stories. Okay. I've heard of yeah, abuse. Very... I don't want you to panic. It's nothing to panic about. Mm -hmm. But it is, to me, it's a very sad imprint. Mm -hmm. um, there was somebody killed in your backyard. I do think there were landowners that lived here initially that um, did not treat people so well. Mm -hmm. The male, I feel him here. I don't use this phrase very often, but he was an evil person. Mm -hmm. And I do think he had something to do with the man that was killed in the back. He's going to do whatever he can to try to get you to give up. If he could burn this house down, he would. Like I keep seeing, things on fire. It's constantly setting fire, constantly setting fire. We had a number of people who heard that. Is that a fire alarm? And that's weird.
you've struck a thought. <laughs> I've heard of history of fires in this town. Florence burned several times. First time it was uh, facing west, and when they rebuilt, they built it north. So that's the reason it's built with facing north now. Do we know what caused the fire? From what I know, th they don't know. I mean, you know. But the fire created, but whatever the fire was, created the, the uh, geographical reconfiguration? Uh-huh. And that's what, that's what he was saying, that, that, that they, they, yeah. It's a fire detector. Or, or right there, there in the hallway. Smoke detector. We're talking about fire and the smoke detector. Battery beeps. My neighbor, Erin, next door, moved there when she was five years old. And uh, she's had a very significant part in this house. But the main thing is that when she was five years old, she would tell me that there was something buried in the backyard. And I would say, what? and she'd say, it might be a body. I've lived in this house next door um, since I was about five years old. And ever since I've lived here, I've always thought there was something different about next door, even as a child. I, I would walk over there sometimes, and one day I was over there and I just had a strong feeling of, oh, there's something, something different. And uh, I was probably six or seven years old and I was just convinced that there was somebody buried in the backyard. And um, I, I told my parents for years that there is somebody buried in that backyard. And uh, you couldn't convince me otherwise. And I, I still think that now. I was very adamant about it as a child. And I still get that feeling over there. And when I'm in that spot, I'm just driven to that, that particular area and I always have been. One time, I, I said I was going to go dig it up and prove that there was something there. If you walk between our house and Alice's, you'll see the property line, these big oak trees that make a straight line. That's the property line. It seems like once you cross that property line, you're, In a you're, different you're protected. Dimension. Yeah, yeah. More or less. My parents said we've never had anything happen. Um, we've never noticed anything, heard anything, but the minute you cross back over this tree line into her yard, it, um, you can just feel it that it's here. I was visiting with Miss Alice once, and we were sitting in the dining room up under the, the chandelier light, and she goes, look, look up. And I looked up, and the, the chandelier, um, it had rotated itself, like with the chain, there was no tension in it. It was, it was tilted on its side. And I screamed, I mean, real loud scream, and she screamed. And both of us jumped up and ran over to the front door. And the chandelier let go, and it was swinging so hard and far, like this, just going. Like uh, a pendulum. Yeah, that. it was scary. I've been scared over there and scared to go over there many times. Here, give you a light. Thank you. Hey, Erin. Hi. So. I'm doing well. How are you? Good. Good to see you. You too. How are you? Oh, good. Long time no see. Yeah. You doing all right? Yeah, I'm hanging in there. Good, good. So we're going to go to where you think there might be something in the backyard. Yes. Okay. A couple of spots. So we're going to follow you. Okay. Okay. Watch your space. So you felt like drawn to this spot? Aaron? Yeah, since I was uh, probably about six years old, I've always thought that there was there's something over on this land. And every time I was in one of in this spot, one of the stronger ones, I've just always thought it was a body here or something significant happened to a body here. 
but this is one of the main ones. This was the one that I, I came to when I was real little. But we would come over here and play like little tea parties and oh. stuff in her backyard. She'd let us yep. and and I just didn't want to come play in this spot. Aaron actually did find four bodies near the Pearl River. People knew they were there from the Civil War and uh, adults were trying to find those bodies and they couldn't. Now, uh, the guy told me that when he took me along that sometimes children are more open to to things that adults want to be closed-minded to. And so he wanted me to try it. And um, everywhere that I walked over and they crossed, they put a flag and then later that day went and did whatever they do. And where I had marked, they found all four bodies. That validates what you feeling here. Yeah, right. Mean, what else? How could you have more validation than that? That's impressive. Well, you want to try to do a EVP session right here? Sure. Are you OK with that? Oh, yeah, until I fucking run. <laughs> <laughs> look, you, look, you know you can grab onto me. You okay. trust me after a few years, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I'll do it. I'll hang. I'll, okay. I got it. <laughs> All right. You ready? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Is there somebody out here in the yard or the land? Can you give us some kind of sign that you're aware that Aaron is standing right here? Do you know Aaron? It's like rustling in the yeah. bushes. Yeah. Is there something buried in the yard? I'm not gonna lie, I jumped a little bit. That was, a little, that was kinda loud. <laughs> that was kinda loud, whatever that was. I Can you tell like us I'm what you saw? Really? Yeah. Real sick. sick. Mm-hmm. Just give me, I just need to breathe. Okay. I need to breathe for a moment. You want to walk out this way? Mm-hmm. Which way? Just over here to the bushes. Oh, my God. You OK? Mm-hmm. You okay? My stomach just got tied up in knots. It's okay. Mm. I don't think I've ever spent longer than four seconds standing in that spot. Let's get Aaron inside. Let's wrap it up for the night. Right now, we have Dog roaming the property and trying to see if he can get hits and uh, see if he can pick up on the scent of uh, the bacteria that feeds on human remains. Probing to aerate the soil so that if there is any cadaver source here, it will allow the, the odor to come up easier and make it a little stronger for the dog to be able to work. Slight interest, and you could see where he kept going back to that one area, so I'm gonna run him through that area. someone buried, the dog's going to pay, show a lot of interest to the trees. If a body's buried somewhere and, it's, and trees grow up, well, they use the body as nourishment. And so the tree takes on that odor, and it's in their leaves and things like that.
He's going around these clumps of trees. These are the only trees that he's looking up into, you know, because there's a lot of trees on this property. But this section was what he's showing interest in and in looking up into the trees. It's kind of like when we did the case in another state, the body was buried. Uh, and then they went back and dug it up and moved it to another location. The odor and the decomp was still in the ground. So it's that type of thing. So yeah, it could be w way old. He's not giving us a definite location. He's just giving us where he's picking up odor and it's coming through the trees. It's the odor that he's been trained for. I would investigate and see whether or not there was a cemetery here and if they moved any bodies, and that may give you an answer to why the odor is here. We brought some cadaver dogs over there, right? Uh huh. Um, which, I mean, they smell decomposition and bacteria that feeds on human bodies, that sort of thing. And those dogs were picking up that odor in and around her yard. And so we wanted to do a little research and see if perhaps there's ever been any sort of evidence of a burial there or a graveyard at, at any point in time. This is a picture of the Florence Cemetery. Right, yep. This part that's clear that is the original part of the cemetery. All this when here? It, all of this. Okay, okay. When the town burned, all of the records were burned. Mm -hmm. And there is not any records anywhere on that part of it. I see. Do you think where Miss Alice's house is that perhaps there could have been something like that before record keeping, like before it all burnt? To it could be, but if it is, I don't think there's any record of that. So if there was a grave of some sort or a burial where Miss Alice lives now, it would have to have been before the fire. Right. In regards to this, where is Alice's house? Is it, say, north? Okay. Is it uh, like, east or west? All right. She's on this Clemorex Road. Okay. So it would be up here. Okay, so her house is somewhere. Her house would be on down in here. So her house is around here where the unmarked section is. Right, it would be on, on by there. So there are plenty of unmarked burials in Florence, but uh, no real evidence to show that it's right there on Alice's property. But nobody knows where those burials were prior to the fire. Uh, after the fire, everything was destroyed, all the records uh, for the town. So there could have been something prior. Uh, we can't jump to any conclusions, but uh, we can speculate. Would you ever consider moving back into the house and living here? What would it take? I, uh, if I didn't live here alone, you know, if somebody else lived with me, I, I probably, you know, I could do it, I could do it. But, but alone here, uh, I haven't come to that point. I mean, I haven't been to that place yet. I really haven't. I'm not saying I couldn't, but I haven't, I'm not right yet. Because I still, <laughs> I still don't know where I might end up. I hope this process helps her, I, I really do. That's the goal, that's what we're trying to. Uh, I think we're 80% there, to be honest with you. I think we're about 80% there. Are we ever gonna get her back in the house, sleeping at night, I don't know. Uh, I hope through this process, it, uh... There's no crying at ghost hunting. So, I wanna get to the point where we can get her at peace with all of this. She wants to get back here. She wants to live here. She wants to be in here. She wants to do everything. She knew it was the place to raise a family, her daughter, everything. Uh, and it was taken away from her. And uh, we need to get that back. The reason I still have my house and I haven't sold it is because I really believe it has a purpose. I think, you know, opening it up to people is the way that something will be found. If I sold it, somebody else may not be open to that. But I think there's more to it. 
I think everybody involved in this house has a, has a real closeness, a genuine concern about each other. I really have enjoyed the people that I've met. Uh, I have a lot of uh, special affection for John and Brad. I mean, I really do. I feel like they're family. Even though we have our lives separate from here, we, we are definitely uh, connected here. It's been quite a ride from the first day I was here to my current uh, relationship and friendship with Miss Alice. Alice will be in my life forever, even uh, maybe when I pass away, I can, when I cross over. If she crosses over before me, we'll, we'll hang out. If, uh, if I cross over before her, well, maybe I'll kick the ball down the steps on her. Being involved in investigating paranormal activity has become a midlife second win for me. It's something that I've found that I really, really enjoy doing. And couple that with helping a friend, Miss Alice, really has been beneficial for my life. It's, it's, it's added a, a, a fresh chapter in my midlife years. It's, it's made me want to get up and, and hit, hit the ground running more in, in my life. So it's a very, very important part of my life now. We're a great team. We make time for each other. And I think that we are locked in to figuring out what's going on in the house. I would like to see Alice in a happy place where she's satisfied with the work that we've done. I think she's gotten some answers. I think there's key answers that she still has not had. An end game for the Mississippi House, in my opinion, I don't know if there is one. I think that this is a house where we're learning, we're teaching, and I think it's something that we can continue to do for years to come. Here. What do you mean you put it on this one? I aimed that camera. You cancel, did? Cancel, cancel. Dude, you did the camera. Hey, the check this. I aimed the camera. Check it. Here, check it. How do you check it? I don't know. Brad, I, I got it. chills right now. Dude, that just did that. I know, wasn't near it. Nobody was there. I saw that. Dude, we got Dude, that. Dude, here. We got that. Do you know how to check it on there? How to bring it up on there? Yeah, this will be quick right here. That's OK. It'll be. It'll be. Are you kidding me right now? <laughs> Don't believe it. Yeah, here we go. Here's my last shot. It was rolling. Yeah, we got it? Yeah, it's not there anymore. All right, so I was inside, and I was running around. I'm trying to get this gear sent out because we have gear shipping out today. Got the camera. I'm messing with that, and I'm just going inside of that house, and nobody was right here at all. Nobody was in the house. It was just me. Uh, and I'm walking by and all of a sudden I hear this ball falling, falling down the stairs and there it is. We're checking if we have it on camera right now. There's the ball and it came from up there. I like it, but uh, the fact that there's people in the house moving around, okay. all that stuff, yeah. just kind of makes me like... I, I was the only one in the house. Yeah, it's true. You know what I mean? 
and I, yeah, I, yeah, I promise, outside. dude. Like, I this whole thing's about honesty. Yeah. Like, I'm honest with you guys. I was walking with the ball as it was. Well, we just saw. Do, that. I heard a noise and I looked over and it was like, dunk, 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 dunk. I mean, we. Um, I mean, this is the clip. This is the footage we've been waiting. Like, this is the evidence that we've been waiting to get. What's that? Oh no, that means it's now. Uh oh. Oh, dude. Can you pull it back? Oh, yeah. Yeah. What, like, what are your thoughts? I'm really curious what well, you think. I mean, you guys see this all. Look, okay, see, look I at this. I'm going to yeah. pause it. I'm going to yeah. frame this. Yeah. Hey yeah? What? Get out of here. So we had a door move? I don't know. It sounded like the front door opened or closed. But No, I definitely heard that. I you thought it was Alice. Dude, I got freaking chills on my hair right now. Wait a second. No, no, Get no, out of no. here. No, wait, wait, wait. What? Let's hear that. Okay. I think oh. the wind probably blew the door okay. open. All right. I mean, that would be my assessment. I think that's what it is. Okay. Honestly, I think. You know, everybody, just for whatever reason, leaves this door like this. It's yeah. not really. Yeah. But that doesn't explain the ball. What do you think? I mean, it's happened in this house many times, like eight or nine times. So, I mean, it's always exciting when it happens. It's always exciting when it happens. I mean, that door sound is interesting. But the only thing is, I mean, it could be wind, right? Wait. Well, yeah. Ooh, the door is open? So it closes by itself. Wait a minute. Well, th assuming it's that door. Because I thought it was that front door swinging open and hitting the closet door. But the door's open right now. So it either wasn't that door or it was a different door. Definitely sounds like a door closing. A few days went by and I was wondering what that noise was. Something that I wanted to figure out. And it was just bothering me, it was frustrating me, for real. It was a frustrating four or five days, I think. I was trying to figure out what it was. The camera back there, it was aiming that way behind me. And I noticed some movement in the reflection of the chandelier that has a, a brass ball that like on, on, on beneath it. So I started looking closer at that and I zoomed in and then bam. My heart started racing. What I saw, you know, with two two different doors um, opening, and then one of them opened and closed. It's like something. It's like something just came through. It's one thing to capture a door opening, but it's really a different level when you see a door open and then close itself. That that I, I mean, I haven't seen that before. Now, I can't tell you what, <laughs> what the heck did that, but something moved not only the chandelier, but opened and closed doors. It's very interesting. That's important to me. Theoretically, Augusta Wind could open them maybe, but open and close it, two of them, in theory, I guess it's possible. You know, and don't forget, you know, minutes, minutes before that, a baseball was flipped down the steps and the doors were closed. Not to mention there was hardly any breeze at all. This is a Mississippi hot summer day. So, so when you 
bundle all that up and you look at that, that is some dramatic activity all within minutes. You see, I mean, we got lights like coming. Yeah, the lights are freaking out. I don't have all the answers. I just don't think it was normal. You know, was it a ghost? Yeah, it could be. It wasn't a human in physical form. This is an, this is going to continue on. It's 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 not to the point where she'll just be okay and it's over with. She, until we can figure out what's going on, Miss Alice is going to want to pursue and keep trying to find the answers. What created those lights? And I'll be right by her side. We're gonna, we're going to do this together and figure this out. Bless Alice, Lord, and be with her always. I think the attraction to all of it is there's always been the question. What's after death? And anybody who hasn't thought about that's a liar. I think if you find proof of ghosts, then you found your proof of life after death. And you don't have to just take it on faith. And we being human beings would like to have proof of it. Uh, I really think that's the attraction of it. I, I think that that will always be the attraction of ghost stories. I think this is one of those mysterious areas of life that this is gonna to have to be something that people deal with in their own hearts, their own minds, and come to their own conclusions and just be true to themselves. Growing up, my grandmother told us one time that uh, they had a ghost at their house. Every night, that ghost would come there and go up the steps. So finally, they decided they would go and they would find out what the ghost was. They went out that night, and about the middle of the night, here comes several ghosts going up and down the steps, up and down the steps. <laughs> so their ghost was a goat ghost. <laughs> T-bomb. <laughs>